Good morning. Again, this is Katherine Harris. I'm chair of the California OER Council, and I want to welcome you to the first webinar in support of the College Textbook Affordability Act of 2015. The topic that we're working on today is a general overview of the AB 8798 RFP and the very essential elements of identifying campus partnerships. Some of you may have already attended the informational conference that we held on March 2nd. That's great. If you have questions that are deeper than what we're going to go into with the general slideshow today, please do feel free to ask them. Just a reminder, we are recording and we'll be re posting this later today. And also feel free to have conversations in the chat bar with each other. Part of the purpose of doing these webinars is getting everyone together to brainstorm as well. We'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the very end for some questions and concerns or sharing some struggles that you've got on your particular campus. So again, good morning and away we go. I'm going to share my desktop with everybody now. So some of you may have seen that AB 798 came out of the state legislature in September 25th, 2015 when Governor Brown signed it. The California OER Council then spent the next a uh, couple of months putting together the RFP, the rubric, so to make sure that all of the legalities of AB 798 got into the RFP. There's $3 million to give away, and we do want to give away as much as possible. In fact, we'd like to give it all away in this first round. So we are inviting everybody who wants to apply to certainly consider Welcome applying on any conference. So the, the incentive program itself is five essential elements, faculty professional development, professional de development for staff whose work support there are providing two students participants with on the call, including you. You are joining your conference as a participant. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. Good morning. We're just going through some slides here that uh, will be available later on today. One of the other things is OER curation activities, which seem to be a very, very much at the forefront of everybody's questions when we met on Wednesday at the conference. Uh, it's also to support technology uh, support for students, staff, and faculty. So you can see that this is not necessarily one-way arrows. Everything is going to connect together, and the academic senates play a very big role. So the senates are to adopt a resolution to increase student access to high-quality OER and reduce the cost of textbooks and supplies. We had many questions about the use of the exact language that was provided in the RFP if any of the academic senates had an issue with it, could they change? And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Academic senates also approve a plan in collaboration with students and campus administration. This is left wide open for all academic senates to figure out approval as they see fit on each of the campuses. It doesn't necessarily have to go through the formal resolution. Uh, some people proposed that they were going to send it through their executive council. Uh, others proposed that they were going to turn it into a full-blown resolution that the entire academic senate has a, a say in, while still others created ad hoc committees to craft a plan and then work with the academic senates to approve it. So then we have the OER Council's role in that. What are they doing? Still here? And then we have the plan itself. It needs to provide detailed information about the technological or staff support. It's very important to the sustainability and to the success of the entire plan. Describe how faculty will learn about the California Open Online Li Library for Education. This could be in the form of workshops and professional development, or it could be um, a module course, an online course. It must include the number of academic departments and course sections where OER will be adopted. And we put that in there because, and it's also in the bill, because we want to see a broad spectrum of disciplines represented, if possible. Not all campuses have a huge spectrum. And we wanted, to, we wanted to, it not just to be STEM disciplines as well. 
You'll also include the anticipated percentage of cost savings for students. Now this has got to be the uh, at least the 30% cost savings and we'll, we can go over that formula as well. You need to include ways existing faculty develop, development programs will be used or enhanced. One of the things that we urge you to do is look around on your campus. You might already be doing some of these professional development or faculty workshops that you can just adopt and repurpose for this particular plan. How, to, how access to OER will provide, be provided to students. This is very integral to the entire plan. You can work with your bookstore to provide print on demand or the library or find some other way to do print on demand for students who don't want to use the textbooks online themselves. And you also have to detail the grant amount requested. It's between $10,000 and $50,000. So the grant can't be more than 1,000 per course identified in the plan. That's just a formula. It's not necessarily how much you're allowed to spend per course. There was a question that came up before that $1,000 doesn't even cover a faculty release time. This is just a formula that we use to calculate how many sections are being used. Once you, in your plan, you will detail how exactly you're going to use that money and how you're going to distribute it across your campus. Course participation will only count if the student savings are greater than 30%. And the grants range, like I said, $10,000 to $50,000, with $3 million available. Now in the UCs and the, uh, and, I'm sorry, excuse me, not the UCs, the California Community Colleges and the CSUs, there are over 100 different campuses. This means that if everybody applies, we, we're allowed to give just 100 grants overall. If everybody applies, that means there will probably be about 30 campuses who can't get the grant itself and will have to apply for second round funding. So we don't necessarily want this to be competitive. We want to see everybody successful with their proposals. And we do have limitations on what we can offer everyone. So the role of the OER Council is at your service. You'll see from the calendar of webinars that in April we release very specific topics that you could possibly use for professional development, while March is still using informational and getting working on your plan, finding people on campus to work with, convincing faculty to work with you. In May, we'll have open office hours and we invite you to send us the drafts of your plans so that we can take a look at them and also working with Cool for Ed, uh, Jerry Hanley and uh, Leslie Kennedy and we will give you comments back on your draft itself. The plans are due, everybody's due at the same time, June 30th. And then the council will get together using the rubric and start to score all of the plans. It's based specifically on the scoring of the rubric. There's no other way that we've manipulated or worked anything around. And the makeup of the council, of people who will be reading the reviews, are at least one from a community college, at least one from a CSU, and at least one from a UC. And then we'll get together and we'll also talk about them further in July and August. So one of the first things that we need to assess, and perhaps if you're new, you might not know where to find OER textbooks. You don't have to start over or start fresh from just searching on the internet, and you can assure faculty that we've already done this work for you. You can go to Cool for Ed. And this is Cool for Ed. Here you'll find on the front page, many of you have probably already seen the RFP. You can find e-textbook reviews. And these are the ones that have been rigorously peer-reviewed by CSU, UC, and California Community College faculty. And if you go through, you can see all, all of the, there's about 50 courses uh, with at least two or three textbooks each that have been reviewed. You can go to Merlot and start doing searches there. Make sure that you understand the licensing, though. It has to be open educational resources with a Creative Commons license or free resources. So the collection that we've created on Cool for Ed with the Council is a way to also find highly ranked tech 
a textbook, which we'll go over in a little bit as well. You're not limited to these, but we do recommend that you can start there and then move out to other OER textbooks. We have a course showcase with 50 CID courses and selected e-textbooks over on Cool for Ed. Let's go over there again. So the course showcase provides you with the course and the CID number. You get the general course description and the recommended free textbook and the faculty reviews and then other recommended e-textbooks. If we click on it, you can see that it goes to CID, which is the articulation number and the articulation agreement between community colleges and UCs and CSUs. And right now we have 47 different courses available. We've got three more to put up. You can use this as a starting point. We have reviews of the e-textbooks, which I've already mentioned. And then we also have a faculty showcase. And in the faculty showcases, if we take a look at these as well, they are e-portfolios created by faculty who have used OER textbooks. Now, we also ran a fall pilot project where we helped faculty to adopt OER textbooks last fall 2015, and they created e-portfolios. And in these e-portfolios, they provide details over here on the right-hand side the OER adoption process, the whys, the ideology, the student access and their experiences with it, student feedback. And then in the middle column, you have a discussion about curriculum, not just the syllabus, but a sample assignment, the learning outcomes, and if they tested to see if any grades improved based on the use of OER or if they remain the same. I encourage you to go through and just take a look at all of these e-portfolios, all of these faculty who are from various community colleges and CSUs who demonstrate the efficacy and the use of OER textbooks. And also, just in case, you might want to show these to your colleagues who might not know that, that OER has advanced a lot and it's a rigorous peer-reviewed textbook that, that might be available for them. You can also go to the Molo Library and do a search that will, you can do the search and narrow it down to OER materials or Creative Commons materials or a particular discipline or even a particular course. So this is what we're doing for you guys. This is what we're offering. For communication and outreach, sample memos about AB 798, emails and flyers about webinars. We have those available and ready to send to you in a packet if you would like to send them out to your faculty and staff on campus or hand it over to your provost or president. All of the webinars you can register for, register for right now. The calendar is set, and you can see that various council members are running them. You can also see a calendar of conferences around the state that are happening uh, as we speak, and they're outside of just webinars. You can go to the conferences themselves. We're also uh, starting with toolkit number two to be released in April. We'll have how-to videos uh, as, and tutorials for you to use, demonstrate to faculty or to use with students in the classroom. A really good one that we've been working on is a tutorial for students on how to study using an e-textbook. Things like turn off all social media, turn off all notifications so you can have a moment of deep attention when you're looking at your e-textbook. Help and support services. Uh, we recommend that you look to your reference librarians and campus technology support and go to the bookstore early on to talk about how they can be involved in this entire plan. You'll see that OpenStax, which is an OER textbook provider, they have print copies at the ready. They're printed and beautifully bound in uh, great bindings, and students often find that they will pay the $25 to do the print copy to do the print on demand. All you have to do with your plan, though, is propose the OER version that is free and give students the option for the print versions. Use the Cool for Ed library. Use the ePortfolios in Merlot as well as in Cool for Ed. And put a link to Cool for Ed in your learning management systems. And Merlot also has an LMS integration in case you find textbooks there. 
If you haven't already done so, go and talk to your campus leadership. And then we have Cool Voices online community that we're establishing now so that you can go and have a conversation and talk to other people and see what the struggles are. Maybe you can collaborate across campuses, which is also a viable option. So the very brief timeline that you're concerned with right now, June 30th, proposals need to be submitted. September 30th, get the money. October 2016 to June 2017, conduct year one of your program. June 30th, 2017, submit a progress report. We do have an option, then you can encourage your faculty to do it, to contribute to an e-portfolio to demonstrate what they have learned and what they did with the OER textbooks. One of the things we want to be clear about, we're, we're looking for student savings. Once faculty members get the OER textbook into the classroom and actually use it, they may find that it doesn't work. And it's OK to report that. We want to see productive failure and how it can be made better. If possibly you get bonus funding and another set of grant funding, what would you do differently? So step one, and you'll see that step one, if we go back over to Cool for Ed, handy dandy steps one through four. You don't necessarily have to do them in order, but they give you, they break down the tasks over the next three to four months. Review the RFP and the evaluation rubric. Review the background resources. And these include AB 798, and they're also tied to SB 1052 and 1053. Take a look at the basics about OER. Please feel free to forward all of these. If anybody has questions about what is a CC license or a Creative Commons license. We also have a primer in here about finding open textbooks and fostering faculty adoptions with all the places that you can go. And then finally, we have reference materials about open textbook use. In this bibliography, we have heard from faculty that they want to hand over published, peer-reviewed articles to faculty and other administrators to demonstrate the efficacy of the use of OER textbooks. And we've listed here several different references that you can print out and just hand over to somebody or email them to demonstrate that there's been a lot of work done in OER materials. And one that's especially interesting is also a set that's tied to, just recently came out, that's tied to learning outcomes. And that's the very first one in the bibliography. Use these sources to help you figure out what it is that you would like to do in your particular plan. So the other thing is brainstorm and draft goals and an implementation plan with your campus stakeholders. But I would say this also includes students in the Students Association. They'd be very pleased to be brought in on this, and they should know about it as well. And then check out toolkit number one. So the toolkit is available from a link available from the RFP front page on Cool for Ed. And all of these things you can simply share with just one link uh, over to somebody who's interested about in oh, using OER materials. And we do have next week creating a grant proposal. We'll have a webinar that focuses specifically on this. So before I go on, I've been talking for 20 minutes now. I just want to stop for a moment and see if there are any questions about the general aspects of the RFP and AB 798 before we go into a specific topic about mobilizing people on campus. Yeah, hi, I have a, a question. I don't know if you go can ahead. Hear me. Okay. Um, so I'm and this may, may be too specific, but it's about, you mentioned something about the print on demand option. Um, and that's where I'm having a, a bit of a challenge, and I thought maybe if you could address that. Um, some of the books that I'm finding have an NC license, which means we can't sell them through our bookstore. And I'm just wondering what, what we're supposed to do about those. Can you say again what kind of license they have? I didn't catch that. Oh, um, NC. So it's Creative Commons, but it's, uh, you know, there's all those subsets. Um, they're mm -hmm. serialized, but um, also non-commercial. Um, non which means you can you can print them and give them to students, but you can't make a profit, which our bookstore would have to do. 
So okay. what I would Right. So the dilemma I hear from you is talking about you can't partner with the bookstore because the bookstore would definitely have to charge for print on demand. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So in some of those uh, instances, we are researching right now uh, print on demand that's available for free online. And one of the things that's happened with the CCNC is that if you contact the author and let them know, what you're doing and ask mm -hmm. them to add a designation, a CC, a different CC designation so that students don't necessarily have to go to the library and print out their 300 page textbook themselves, uh, then we've had success in doing that. We're also reviewing online services that allow students to go and do it themselves. Okay, great. And the, the council will let us know um, if, if those become available for everybody? Yes, we what we want to do is review them first. We found six, right? We found six of them uh, on Wednesday, and so we're hurriedly going through them to make sure that they are all that they promised before we recommend them. Fabulous! Thank you so much. Sure. And just a, a reminder: if you take a look at, I'm going to go back over to my desktop. In Cool for Ed on the home page, you'll see down at the bottom both the contact us and register to receive updates. That's the kind of thing we would send out in an update blast, uh, as well as when the next uh, webinar would be. So if we find out in the next week or so, we'll send it out on that, that update. And it's just an easy form, Google form that you fill out, and we send you information as it comes to us. Before I move on, are there any other questions? So let's move on to some specifics. So how do you find stakeholders? This is the biggest number one thing that everybody talks to us about because it's like that blank screen or that cursor that's mocking you. Do you start cold calling and cold emailing different disciplines or departments? How do you find these other faculty to bring them together? Or it might be a department chair or it might be a college dean. You can start with one faculty member, or you can start in a more top-down scale by going to your president and moving from there. Or perhaps it's located in the library, and the library associates who go out and have relationships with different departments would be willing to go and proselytize this particular and inform everybody about this particular set of money and start mobilizing those faculty. You know, you don't have to do it alone, though. And we've found a few great slideshows to help you out with this and I'm going to mobilizing faculty is the first one. What do you say to people? Again, the slides will be distributed and all this information will be available to you. So there are different strategies to use. The word of mouth strategy, which I call also the pub phenomenon. You're talking to people and you find out that they have an interest in this. You might also think about asking if you can go to speak to the new faculty forums when they come in. Maybe you have some new ones that are coming in this quarter or semester and see if any of those faculty are interested. So this is built on the CSU's affordable learning solutions. And it, that's now at all 23 of the CSU campuses. And we're just looking at their best practices. And they say the faculty ambassadors really going to people who are very involved in or interested in being involved in using OER or free materials from the library itself. That word of mouth scale is, accounts for a lot of the success that we found at the affordable learning solutions on the CSU campuses. And we think it can work at the community college level. We need more information from you guys as well. So what do you say to these people? How do you convince them if you're sending out an email or you're talking to them? Also on the slide, we've got uh, mobilizing faculty as these ambassadors, the value proposition framework. Now that sounds like it's something that you would use in maybe a business ethics class or something like that to convince people. But you'd be surprised. It's working. 
So what do you say to faculty? Talk to them about adopting open or low-cost course materials. How do they do it, which is most of what, what they want to know. How are they going to get help to do it? Why should they do it? Save students money on the cost of textbooks. And then the value proposition. It empowers faculty to save their students money on the cost of textbooks. And it also helps with student success. That's what's been demonstrated so far in the, a lot of the work that we've seen and the research that we've seen. It eliminates the need to work through student financial challenges. You know, you have students coming up to you, that everybody does, saying that their financial aid check hasn't come through and it won't come through till the second or third week in classes and they can't buy their textbooks until they get that money. So they're struggling and they're already behind. So this is one of the things it does. It eliminates that need for students to wait for financial aid to catch up to them to purchase all the materials. It offers your students a customized collection of course materials that are mapped to your course lesson plan. One of the things that we really encourage, you can use an OER textbook, something like what OpenStax has created. Their physics textbook is great. It's one textbook. It's all in one location. You can just send students to that. But what if that textbook doesn't work for you? Or what if that faculty member needs to replace a series, maybe a very expensive course pack? Well, in that situation, you can work with one of your librarians to, or go to Merlot and start collecting materials that are subscribed to through databases at the library. These materials are free to students, even though the library may pay for a subscription. So think about the alternatives to a full OER textbook if you can't find one out there and encourage faculty to go through the library to find those materials that would be free for students. So one of the other things that we've also found is that this helps establish an equitable learning environment for a lot of students because students don't often want to tell each other, I can't afford to buy the textbook right now. You can also go through your department chair and see a department chair, any of the department chairs, and see who would be interested in that particular department level adoption. This doesn't have to be required, but some departments, such as perhaps a math department, does do a department level adoption for a particular course that every student has to take in, uh, in the college or the university. And then the dean of the college, what do you say to the dean? It creates greater student demand for courses. We have found that if you offer two of the sections of the same course and the textbook is tied to the course and they can, students can see it before they register, students will choose the course where they're using the free or the low cost textbook instead of the other course. And it's demonstrably severe in terms of enrollment. So increasing student enrollment, this is what deans speak. They love to hear these kinds of things. Uh, and some of the same things apply here, creates a, uh, a model for an equitable learning environment and student-centric culture, remove student barriers to obtaining a course material throughout the college. So these are just lift this language explicitly and start talking to your deans. So I also pointed out before the case studies and the published research in the toolkit, and then also go to the faculty stories and look through them. So who else? Your bookstore might be involved. Your library and librarians might be involved. Educational technology group in whatever instantiation it is on your particular campus or perhaps with the community college. There is a region of particular colleges that can work together through their ed tech group. And definitely work with your student association. The CSSA was at our meeting on Wednesday, and the rep was really adamant that you go and, and speak with your students, but also through the CSSA in general. Sign up for more informational webinars. Consult the frequently asked questions, and let's just go over there. And also, please help us with the frequently asked questions. If there's something on here that we haven't gotten to. Here they are. 
These are available from the front page of the Cool for Ed. If there's something that you need to have a question about, definitely email us. You've got an email at the front here, coolfored at cdl.edu. We'll respond to you, but we'll also ask it, add it to the FAQ for other people as well. And this is the registration Google form to request for updates. We really encourage you to sign up for this so that we know that people are interested. So the Academic Senate proposal, and this is an important one. It's going to take a little bit, a little while to do. If anybody knows who's been working with Academic Senate. So when you send and request a proposal be sent to your Academic Senate, we do have a sample proposal in the RFP for both the community colleges and the CSU. There is required language, and this is explicitly required language. We've seen some proposals lately that make the language much more squishy, replacing hard verbs with perhaps or maybe. We need this language to be exact in here. And some of the ways that have been recommended getting around issues and arguments about academic freedom for faculty are to put this clause in the whereas and then in the resolved institute whatever the campus needs to institute. You can also send us your draft to the Cool for Ed email address and ask us. Ask us before you send it up for the first reading to the Senate and we'll definitely supply some feedback for that. But also check out Sac State is the CSU and then there's some language that's also been added in terms of the community colleges. So before I go any further, is there anybody who has a question? about the Academic Senate proposals? Are you guys already on board? Have you done this already? OK, I see in the chat the yeses and finding enough sections. If you need help with talking to your faculty senators as well, please do let us know. We can help you out with language um, to deal with arguments about academic freedom, which has been the biggest thing that was brought up both on Wednesday at our informational conference as well as in emails and questions we've received. So some brainstorming examples. What do we do? What's a campus plan look like? Who are our stakeholders? How do we go about this and how do we start? So some of the things that we do recommend. If you're casting about for disciplines to look at in, on your particular campus and you're looking at sections that are highly enrolled or they have an articulation agreement or they're high impact, we can provide you with a roadmap for that in the Cool for Ed reviews. We go over to that, back to that. So you see we've divided it up by disciplines. Here's accounting, managerial accounting, our history, introduction to biology, business, you might want to think about starting with those disciplines first on your campus and targeting some of the faculty who teach some of these sections or similar sections on your particular campus. And this just gives you a way to start looking into faculty who might be interested and then you can also send them over to uh, look at the e-portfolios as well as looking at the rigorous peer reviews of all of these textbooks. One of the things that you can also do, uh, the textbooks and the courses on Cool for Ed reviews, we spent a lot of time on the council setting up the selection criteria. So the selection criteria include those campuses that are highly enrolled, 
the course works as, on, on as many campuses as possible, and it had a foundation of critical thinking, oral communication, quantitative reasoning, and written communication. And then there's, there are other criteria that were involved as well. You might want to take a look at that and use those criteria for selecting across your campus as well. And this is a public document that's not linked from Cool for Ed, but we will, we're going to include it in our slides. This is the list of textbooks and courses and disciplines that the council has done peer review of textbooks for. And the blue slots just indicate where we're working on finding a reviewer from that particular segment. But you'll also notice we have a section called highly rated textbooks. So for instance, in public speaking, we had one textbook that was highly ranked. If you go and take a look through them, you can see which textbook that was. You can send it over to the faculty member. In art history, there was one highly ranked textbook. And the way we qualified that was a textbook that got threes on a level of one to five, with five being the highest, got threes all the way uh, across in terms of their rankings by the reviewers themselves. Now, again, these are not the only textbooks available. These are the ones that we found that were textbooks that were complete. You didn't have to link around to different chapters in different places. So that was our criteria, criteria for selecting them. So another brainstorming example, can we include these courses or sections that already use OER textbooks? I mean, come on, you have faculty who probably have been using OER textbooks or free materials for their students already. These are your champions on campus. Unfortunately, because they can't demonstrate cost savings, you can't include their course sections in the plan that's for next academic session. So. If you have those faculty, you might suggest to them if they perhaps have a four-pay homework platform, I know statistics has this in chemistry, that if they could go to another textbook uh, four-pay homework platform that doesn't have that uh, same cost and they can demonstrate a 30% cost savings, then they can be included in that round of grant funding. But don't exclude them. Here's what you can do with those faculty who are already on board. They can become the leaders on campus. They can become the leaders of faculty workshop uh, and development, and they can get paid uh, a stipend for that particular work. And you might also ask them to do informational sessions on campus and include them in your plan as how to do distribution and outreach for OER as well. So don't disinclude them. Just include them in a different way. Another question that we got was, this is great infusion of money from the state legislators is incredible, but what do we do after we've exhausted all of those $3 million funds? And a group from a community college mentioned that they could do a study during spring 2017 of their students who are at highest risk and the students who would be evaluated in equity offices with equity issues. In that instance, they might be able to demonstrate that the OER textbook or the free textbook increased that student completion rate. And in that way, for the following year or years, they could tap into the student equity funding, which is, from my understanding, very great across the community colleges in order to continue the use and study and adoption of OER textbooks on your particular campus. Now, we do have student and faculty survey instruments that we already created from our fall pilot project, and we will be sharing that in toolkit number two to be released on April 1st. We sent it through IRB so that we could do studies and we could publish that material and that information. So you are free to use whatever we have created already as an instrument for evaluating or creating metrics on your campus for the measuring the outcomes of using OER materials or free low-cost materials. So at this point, I've run out of stuff to say. Uh, we've been brainstorming and listening to everybody and their comments and concerns. And I want to open it up now, not just to questions, but where are you in your process? And where do you want to be? What else help do you need?
and feel free just to chime in. We have such a small group here that we don't necessarily need to do the hand raising. I also have a, a kind of nuts and bolts question about um, so the, the, what we're supposed to include is tech support and staff support. And I think I'm just not clear on what, what exactly that means. So I guess the coordinator, which is the role that I'm going to be playing, looks for books and helps faculty find books. What would tech support do? That's a good question. So tech support might be if you have uh, an educational technology group with an instructional designer, somebody to help a faculty member integrate OER seamlessly and helpfully. And most of the time, instructional designers pull faculty back so they don't do too much. Another might be, for instance, if you are going to, if your faculty member is going to integrate it into an LMS for an online learning community, how do you integrate it seamlessly so perhaps students don't have to click more than three times to find the actual textbook? I know that OpenStax has um, for instance, an extension or an app that you can load into Canvas so students don't have to leave Canvas to read the materials. So you might need tech support for to help faculty do those kinds of things. And staff support might be also on the end of working through accessibility issues, and I mean in terms of ADA compliance, to ensure that the faculty member uh, and the textbook that he or she has selected is ADA compliant for uh, all students. Does that answer your question? Give you some ideas about how? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, concerns, brainstorming, where you are right now? I have tons of questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Someone else wants go, to Go ahead. Go out. for it. <laughs> Um, so I've been working with a lot of faculty on trying to find books for them. And what I'm running into is um, groups that are really um, wanting to make the change, but there's just nothing available for them. And so I just want to be sure that I'm doing this right. So the, the plan, what I'm going to have them do is do sort of a curation in the department in fall, and then trial that curation of three bits and pieces in the spring. Is that a reasonable approach? So one of the things, I just want to caution you, one of the things that is not allowed for th this particular funding is authoring of the textbook. But if you, by curation, you mean that they're going to work on materials that have already been authored, but they might be piecemeal through the library or something. OK, that's, that's perfectly OK. And then they're doing beta testing in the spring, from what I understand. Yes? Yes. Yep. So that's so the limitation then is that they can't write any new material. They just have to find material and then put it together in a, um, a bundle. Yes. OK. Got it. Thank you. And you can also use the funding to evaluate that material, meaning that you can use our rigorous peer review rubric that we set up happy to share it with you, hand it over to your faculty, ask them to get others to peer review it before they start using it in their particular class. OK, and, and that'll be on the full thread side, yeah? We get, we've got that up already, yes. If you go to the very bottom of all the e-reviews, there's a bunch of data and information there, and you are free to take that if you want. Uh, it's in a PDF form right now, but if you want something that you can just cut and paste, definitely email us and we're happy to send it out. Fabulous. Thank you. How about any others? Where are you in the process? Are you still considering if it's valuable to do this on your campus or have you already started? So Brian, if you have a microphone, do you want to tell us a little bit about the existing program that you've done? I bet everybody else could learn some from that. 
Sure. We're, we're uh, from San Francisco State. We're part of the CSU, so we've had an existing affordable learning solutions um, program. Actually, I'll, I'll put the link into the URL if anyone wants to look at it uh, now or later. Uh, but what we do is we, we've been getting these uh, annual small grants, 20000 or so, from our system and using those to um, fund faculty projects that are designed to reduce the cost of instruction materials to students. Some of those projects use OER, but some of them do not. Um, and uh, what we intend to do is use a lot of the same me mechanisms, uh, marketing, proposal process, uh, you know, th that kind of thing with this uh, with the focus of, you know, clearly on the, the OER uh, for, for the ones that would be in this program. So our, our, our challenge right now is to, is to engage the faculty more in the leadership and governance role because uh, to date we've had some faculty involved in, uh, in, in providing, in collaborating with us and, and putting the program together, reviewing proposals and things like that, but they haven't really been in the leadership role in part because we haven't had the money to um, you know, provide them with enough time, you know, a course release or things like that to make it uh, worthwhile for them, and um, we also, uh, uh, it's difficult. That's one of the things, challenges we're, we're looking at. In part, when we read this here, for example, the coordinator position, um, I think having a faculty member in that role would be extremely difficult uh, at a campus like ours, especially because there's an expectation that they'd be involved for a, potentially up to a four-year commitment of their engaged time. So. Um, so, so what we're doing now is I'm talking closely with our academic senate people about well, how do we, you know, what what can we what can we put together that will you know meet the needs of faculty governance and faculty involvement without um, expecting uh, a commitment they can't look realistic to make, um, or just we don't want someone just who's up there just to be you know kind of a, a showpiece faculty uh, director when uh, when they're not all that engaged. That's kind of where we're at. Well, that's a lot of good information to hear. And I just want to say that we have planned this entire project up through the progress reports being submitted. So that means really in the first year of June 30, 2017. And we hope to give away all of the money. And this is to say that you can propose somebody as a campus coordinator, and it's up to you if on your campus you want to rotate that campus coordination, coordination every year, you can write that into your plan so that one faculty member doesn't necessarily have to feel they need to make that. It's a massive commitment to make a four-year commitment. Would that work for you, do you think, Brian? Yeah, as a matter of fact, well, I think what we'll probably end up doing is proposing something where we do have, um, you know, a kind of a lead faculty role, maybe even a shared, you know, two or three who get, who get, um, you know, some modest amount of professional development funds, um, and then we have some limited, uh, you know, an agreement, an MOU with them on expectations, but that thing could be renewed every year or it could be changed out for someone else. It's good to know that it's not, you know, that that kind of flexibility is uh, is going to be available to us. Right, and we do ask the campus coordinator to write us a letter of commitment. But if you want to divide the divide that particular uh, administrative role among several faculty, you can certainly do that and highlight that in the campus com the campus coordinator commitment letter, and have all of them sign it, or perhaps they'll have a rotation that they would commit to rather than one person saying, I'm here and available for four years. Can I clarify that the four-year piece, is that a, a CSU piece or a, um, a, a, a something from the act itself? That, that was it, no. That was actually in the legislation itself. But the realities are that faculty can't commit to a four-year project when they don't know if there's going to be funding after the first year. So the, all the council members understand that reality, and we were trying we we're trying to make concessions for that as well. We don't want to put a burden on anybody at all at any campus, and we don't want this to be the reason why you people don't submit. But the letter of commitment does have to specify a plan for four years. If it's rotating or whatever it is, but it, it has to cover all four years? 
It can. We'll, we'll, we don't. We don't really have the bonus funding round set up yet. But in the campus commitment letter, you could say that person will commit to this first year, and then tell us the sustainability model in the next, next year. Somebody else will take over, or uh, that you would have people lined up to do it. Just give us what is the sustainability of the project and consistency. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Jolina or Monica, do you guys have questions? No, I'm pretty sure um, Brian covered all of the, the points on our campus, so I'm good. Thank you. So with that, I invite you to come back to another webinar or invite as many faculty and administrators as possible to come to any of the webinars. We do have some basic ones on what is OER and how to find a textbook. And even if your faculty are not going to commit to do this or maybe your campus might not be including that particular faculty, it's a way to spread the information about OER textbooks or free and low cost materials. So feel free to distribute the calendar far and wide to anybody who wants to come and see something about it. Also, if you don't have time yourself to explain all the benefits of OER and the faculty member or an administrator doesn't have time to attend a webinar, just remember these things are also recorded and we'll be posting them on the calendar themselves. And you just quite simply send the link off to somebody to let them know the benefits of doing these kinds of things. So if there's no more questions, I'm going to conclude this for today. And I want to thank you for attending the very first information we informational webinar for AB 798 Request for Proposals. I wish you good luck. And please contact us early and often in order to uh, be able to have a successful proposal. And we look forward to talking to you more. <laughs>